<clears throat> Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I have a good deal of problems with this bill. Um, I think it's uh, censorship passing as a national inclusion. And uh, I'm not very savvy with the internet. I never have been. And at 72 years old, I doubt if I ever will be. But I do know something about art, a little bit about creativity. So I'll, I'll read to that point. Uh, honorable colleagues, there is a certain essay by Cicero called The Second Philippic, which was written to expose the power of the state against freedom of speech and freedom of thought and the power of one man, Mark Antony. It is a brilliant proclamation and shows Cicero at his best and bravest. It was delivered in the Roman Senate and Cicero paid for writing it with his life. His hands were cut off and taken to Mark Antony as proof that Cicero would never write again. Cicero lived in a dangerous time. When Vasily Grossman completed Life and Fate, his grand novel about the Battle of Stalingrad, it had to be sanctioned by the cultural section of the Central Committee, the wise Soviet think tank of art and culture. They took a year to answer and said that it was anti-Soviet. They did not accept it for publication. It is published now and it is, of course, a wonderful book showing fascism and communism to be mirror images of one another in depravity and contempt for human liberty. There's a great scene in that book where an elderly babushka seen a German youth coming out of the last pocket of German defense in January of 1943, ready to yell and spit and curse him for what he has done to her people, and seeing a 19-year-old boy, a soldier of destiny, terrified, starving and alone, she stops and says, okay, here then, and hands him a piece of bread. Nothing in the book is more significant than that moment, for that moment shows it to be absolutely Russian and for all mankind absolutely universal that the way to fight such mechanized violence and hate is with simple compassion and forgiveness, something that is all too rare today in Canada and everywhere else. I think overall we have become lately a land of scapegoaters and finger pointers offering accusation and shame and believing we are a woke society. Cultural committees are based as much in bias and fears than anything else. I've seen enough artistic committees to know that. That what George Orwell says we must resist is the prison of self-censorship. This bill goes a long way to construct such a prison. Sheldonitsyn, the first circle, was smuggled away from the Soviet bloc as well. One of the grand scenes in it is of a novelist, a favorite of Stalin, sitting down to write a novel and saying to himself, I will now write the truth, but feeling in his mind Stalin's eyes upon him, decides that he cannot and says, my next novel will be the real one. The idea of any hierarchic political deciding what a man or woman are allowed to write to fit a prescribed national agenda is a horrid thing. I'm wondering if anyone on the staff of our Minister of Heritage understands this. In Germany, it was called the Ministry of National Enlightenment, and every radio was run by Joseph Goebbels. Complete ideological manipulation in the name of national purity. No decree by the CRTC could in any way tell us what Canadian content should or should not be, or who should be allowed to bob their heads up out of the new murkiness we have created. Like Orwell's proclamation, the very bill suggests a platform that decrees all animals are equal, but some animals are more equal than others. And Bill C-11 certainly spells out who they might be. I'm not speaking solely of the internet because I'm too old to know it. However, this will bleed over into any performance we tend to create, and we will have government officials holding a book of rules telling us if we are Canadian enough, or worse, who can write about, what, about whom, and I faced that before. You see, I'm not Canadian enough, I never have been. I grew up in a place east of Canada called the Maritimes, and I fought for every inch of soil in my fictional world, and for years that dismissed who I was, and especially who I wrote about. 
but I did so without complaint. But I know who the gatekeepers are. They are still here telling us in C11 that we have progressed our more understanding and our value system has evolved to be inclusive. This statement is a transparent endowment to those who support they need and whom they desire to influence. But it is a terrible insult to the great writers in my country that I know. This is not opening the gate to greatness, but only to compliance. The writers I know don't need to advance to fit an agenda, and neither do the songwriters or bloggers. When this bill mentions how we have evolved, it is simply a suggestion to comply. Some of those who have so evolved into the new Canada have torn books away and slashed many writers I, I admire. An evolution of sanctimony and an advancement in quelling the voices we might disagree with. By this bill, we have ensured the very realms we have fought to dispose of for the last 70 years. C-11 might be more subtle than the German Stasi or the Cultural Committee of the former Soviet Union, but never think it is not intertwined. The very bill suggests a favoritism brought forward by a notional knowledge of what Canada should be and what groups we are now allowed to blame. It also just suggests that there is no communication or interplay between writers of different ethnicities, that identity politics is positive because it teaches a bland society about new voices or about trauma which only certain people are allowed to say they know. It is a balkanization of freedom of expression. It is so narrow-minded that it defeats the very thing it proposes and destroys the principles set forth by Terence over 2,000 years ago. I am human, so nothing human is alien to me. That is, we understand because we identify, not because we are being taught a lesson. One night after my reading at Harbourfront in Toronto, two people approached me. One was the great Irish writer Roddy Doyle telling me he had long admired my work. The other was the First Nation writer Richard Wagmus telling me he started writing because he was influenced by my work. Both were very kind, lived thousands of miles apart, one Irish and one First Nation, and the writing had little to do with identity politics, but it did have much to do with identifying. I do not know who would be able to tell me what Canadian content is and what it is not, but I know it won't be in the Minister of Heritage's power to ever tell me. We have yet to make a great movie about hockey, for God's sake, a great movie about Juno Beach, a great movie about Dieppe, or a movie about the young Canadians fighting to death in Hong Kong. Our ancestors and singers and writers, too, have gone away because they had to, for too many in power have no knowledge about these things. We have filled the world with our talent, but not because of the Minister of Heritage. We have spread our books and movies across the world, but it is not because of some formula. We have insulted so many of our authors and singers, our actors and painters, by not paying attention to them and then claiming them when they go somewhere else. They come back to get the Order of Canada and to be feted at Rideau Hall. Drake is known worldwide, but not because of the CRTC. Thank God Drake was not up to them, or Leonard Cohen, or Gordon Lightfoot either. You see, we have gone back to the age of Cicero without even knowing. In that age, scapegoating was considered a blessing and mob action against one person was considered justice. It was Christ, actually, who taught us that scapegoating was a great lie and pleaded with us by his death never to return to that state. This law will be one of scapegoating all those who do not fit into what our bureaucrats think Canada should be. Stalin, again, will be looking over our shoulder when we write. We have come a long way from Cicero. Thank you very much. On the bar, Senator Smivel de Chen. Oh, sorry, Senator Hawkins, you have, Senator Hawkins, you have a question? Big question. <laughs> Senator Richards, we've, we've heard time and time again, and we heard it again from the sponsor of, of the bill today, how Canada needs to protect Canadian culture. And again, I've said this many, many times, I think C Canadian culture has never been as strong as it is today. Writers and our, our producers, our actors, our, our singers, we've seen what modern day platforms have done for people like The Weeknd and Justin Bieber and so many others. So can you tell us what, if anything, is out there that requires legislation in the Parliament of Canada and the Government of Canada that needs to protect Canadian culture in 2023? 
Senator Richards. Well, uh, thanks for the question. I don't think very much can be in their hands because um, it reminds me of the, of the story about the Czechoslovakian uh, clown in uh, Prague who did this little act and he was brilliant at it. And he had a little hat, a cowboy hat, and he had a lasso and he could flip through the lasso and he was, a, he was an absolute magician. And uh, the state art artistic community stopped him from doing that because it showed, uh, it showed Western culture decadence. That is, that is the kind of thing that, although extremely subtle in this bill, and I say it's extremely subtle, still is an overplay toward, toward a Canadian culture that will undermine it. And that is why I, I spoke today on it. And there, there is nothing in the world that we need, why we need to do that. Senator Cormier, was a question? Senator Cormier, did you want to ask a question? Would Senator Richards take a question? Yes. In French, uh, yes, I'll... Senator Richards, I, I just, I think I, we're from the same province, right? French. And uh, French. I will speak in French, <laughs> and I don't know it's a sign of the differences between us, but je, je vous... I'd like to better understand your argument, your ultimate argument. Like me, you know New Brunswick artists who are indeed well-known abroad. Lisa Leblanc, The Babies, David Miles. All these artists have benefited from public monies. They have benefited from public funding that has allowed them to develop their art and become known around the world, share their art around the world from your F argument, do I understand that that aspect is not necessary so that arts develop in Canada? Uh, Senator Cormier, thanks for the question. They benefit because they were talented. They benefit because David Miles is an extremely talented uh, songwriter and musician, uh, and he's a dear friend of mine. And that's, that, they, talent, they, 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 ex they express themselves in a way that people love because they have talent and greatness not because they're being uh, fed it by the CRTC. There's a great scene in, uh, and I'll just try to be very quick here, about something about what I mean. There's a great scene in Tolstoy's War and Peace, where Bo Boris, who is uh, an enjoué, is sitting in the office of Prince Andre, and there's a lieutenant general sitting beside him who knows about the plans of Napoleon, and yet Boris is asked in first, because he belongs to a culture of an inner circle. And so the lieutenant governor who, who actually knows what's going on is left in the outer chamber. Often our artists that are really very good and very bright and very brilliant are oftentimes left in the outer chamber. They're not noticed because they don't, haven't joined the group that facilitates money and power. That's what I'm worried about. It happens in, it, it happens in Tolstoy's War and peace, and it happens a day and day to artists everywhere. And I'm worried that this bill will, will, will further enhance that. That's my worry. Uh, 